folks, I'm Josh King. Welcome to the first and introductory episode of Rightly Dividing, the ministry of Meridian Church, where I'm privileged to serve as a shepherd. Know that in these episodes, I'm going to be directly addressing Meridian Church. And if you're not from around here, if you're not a member, feel free to stick around. Today, I'm going to set up for future episodes. And my aim today is to lead you in something of the method that I use in studying a passage of Scripture in preparation for a sermon. We'll actually be doing that prep in future episodes. And if you're thinking, I'm not going to be preparing sermons... I think you'll see why the method I use is something you can utilize as well as we go along. Today, we won't actually be using the tools, as I was explaining. I'm going to be laying out the tools, letting you get familiar with them, see them. And the good news is that you already own most of the tools I'm going to speak of today. In fact, the critical tools all the tools that you really need to do bible study i want you to le- i want to let you know you already have them if you can read and you have a bible you already possess the best tools for bible study first a disclaimer i remember hearing a pastor once say that he thought it was critical that a minister keep a distinct time of private devotion that was separate from their Bible study, their sermon prep that they're using to minister. For me, the exact opposite has been true. It's critical for me not to have a distinct time of devotion apart from my sermon prep, but that my sermon prep be distinctly devotional. I remember early in my ministry, John Owen's words being liberating and convicting in this regard. He writes in a work titled The True Nature of a Gospel Church and Its Government. A man preacheth that sermon only well unto others, which preacheth itself in his own soul, and he that doth not feed on and thrive in the digestion of the food which he provides for others will scarcely make it savory unto them. Yea, he knows not but the food he hath provided may be poison, unless he have really tasted of it himself. If the word does not dwell with power in us, it will not pass with power from us. So whenever I begin to study a a book of the Bible, and that's how I study, that's how I think you have to study, whenever I'm several months out from a new sermon series on a particular book, I start hunting for the best resources that are out there. Now, never mind all that. Put that to the side. I'll deal with that in another episode. And at the same time that I'm hunting for the best resources, I begin reading the book again and again and again, as often as I can, before that series comes up. And here's the chief thing to learn in this episode. That that, reading the book again and again and again, is both the first thing that I do And it is the best thing that I continue to do throughout all my sermon prep. Nearly everyone has the best and most accessible tool for Bible study readily available, and it's simply this. Read, 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 read the text. And let me ask one qualifying adverb. Read it prayerfully. This is not only the best method of Bible study that I know, it is the simplest. Read the text again and again and again. 
begin with reading the whole book several times through. And then perhaps pick out a chapter and read it again and again and again for a period of time, a week, two weeks. And then the second chapter, the same thing, the third chapter, and then go back and read the whole book again, and then and then read the chapters again. Now, at this point, some might suggest some very good and helpful questions to use whenever you begin reading and studying some book of the Bible, and that's all very fine. And there are some some great um some great books that talk about the kind of questions you should bring to the text when you begin a Bible study and, and as you continue throughout your study. That that's well, that's good. But I find two things happen just by reading the text again and again. First, I think reading the text again and again and again solves many of the issues that such questions aim at. Who wrote the book? Who was it written to? When was it written? What was the setting? Whenever you read it again and again and again, the text begins to pull you in. Instead of you trying to pull the Bible into your story, it begins to pull you into its story. You realize it was written by someone. You, you begin not just to know it, you begin to really immerse yourself in it. You you sense Paul's Paulness as he's writing this letter. You, you begin to sense who the Corinthians were. You, you immerse yourself into the Bible. Instead of Instead of you mastering the Bible, the Bible begins to master you. And second, by reading the text again and again and again, instead of asking your questions, what you find is the Bible begins to have the sanctifying effect on you, such that you're not only finding answers, but you're finally beginning to ask the right questions. Now, alongside your Bible study, I would encourage you to maintain Bible reading. And I recommend Bible reading for no other purpose than data accumulation and storage. Bible reading is gathering the wood, and Bible study is doing everything you can to start a fire. It's not a guarantee that a rabbit will pop out of the hat, but it is the knocking persistently, prayerfully, doing all that you can, asking God to illuminate his text and and open your eyes. Now, the reason to have a healthy habit of Bible reading alongside your Bible study is this. It relates to what I believe is the primary rule of hermeneutics, and that's the art or the science of interpreting the Bible. And it's this. Remember this, sentences are more important than words, and paragraphs are more important than sentences, and sections are more important than paragraphs, and whole books are more important than sections, and the whole Bible is more important than each book. So sentences are more important than words, paragraphs more important than sentences, sections more important than paragraphs, books more important than sections, and the Bible as a whole is more important than each book. And this is not to pit one part of the Bible against the other. It is to say that you only understand the parts as they relate to the whole. It's to say this, context, context, context. You want to read and study the Bible? What you're constantly aiming at is context. And let me demonstrate how critical this is. A favorite tool of false teachers is word studies. It's one of those tactics that looks really sharp. It sounds knowledgeable. It looks sharp, but it's really sneaky. You take a word from the text And you consider the semantic range, all the meanings that this word could possibly mean. And whenever you do that, you're naturally, I I think many false teachers in this way deceive themselves, you're naturally going to be inclined to the definition that you like best. 
as far as how you want that verse to make sense. And then you insert that meaning, and the word can mean that, but does it mean it in that particular instance? Well, we don't know. You just insert it back because you like it. So if you hear me over say the word blue in a conversation and you've heard nothing else, do you take me to refer to the color or the mood? Well, you can't possibly know. You don't have enough information to make that judgment. How can you know? Sentences are more important than words. And what this means is that the more you read your Bible, the better you'll read your Bible because you'll be reading the Bible in light of the Bible instead of reading it in light of your own mind, your own heart, the, the, the air that we breathe in, the, the, the way of thinking that is natural to fallen man, the, the way of thinking that is being forced upon us continually by this world. Instead of that, you'll be reading the Bible better because you're reading the Bible in light of the Bible. You have to read your Bible in order to read your Bible. You have to read your Bible in order to study your Bible. But now let's come to the next step. How how do we we've I've I've read it a few times through. I'm reading it again and again, but I'm actually going to get ready to preach this text, and so I'm really ready to study a specific portion of this book. And how do I begin? Well, I read it again and again. And and now perhaps you're really itching to get your hands on a tool, a a real tool, you think. Well, <laughs> this is it. Do you realize the folly of searching for a tool to study the Bible that requires you to read your Bible less? And yet, that's what many tools are marketed as, and I don't recommend them. Still, though, a tool I found helpful because it helps me to read not less but better is Logos Bible Software. And I use it to print out a roughly diagrammed, roughly diagrammed, I I don't go through all the steps. You can do that. Logos has that capacity. I just do a roughly diagram. I believe that it's called the text flow diagram. And it's that which I now begin reading again and again. But in order to diagram it, you, you know, you have to read it. And so I read it to diagram it so that I can read it more. I take studying, I hope you're seeing this, to be nothing more than a focused effort at reading well. I'm reading the Bible over and over again to read it well, and I don't think there's any better way to really read well, read closely, understand what is being intended by the author. There's no better way than to diagram it. I'm reading it prayerfully, trusting that God has given His Spirit. God by His Spirit, I'm trusting that God by His Spirit has both given the Word and now illuminates that very Word. And so if you have Logos, go to Tools, scroll down to Sentence Diagram, and set the page orientation to Landscape. That's what I'm going to be demonstrated. You can change this up. This is how I do it. Change the page orientation to landscape. I label my diagram. I insert the passage. And after diagramming, I print it as a PDF file. And the reason I do that is I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's Mac. I don't know what the issue is. But if I just straight print it from Logos, it gets squirrely. So I save it as a PDF, and then I print that PDF. I print it on legal size paper. I set that setting whenever I print it, and I'll you'll see why in future episodes. There's what this does is it leaves me plenty of room to write questions, record observations, record references, other things that you'll see in the future. But there are two bigger tools that I've hinted at here that you might easily overlook. They're bigger tools than logos. 
other than reading the Bible itself. The most useful tools I have found for Bible study are a pen and a piece of paper. Write your questions and thoughts down. Write your thoughts clear. I find um, that it's like pulling a thread. I think Lewis spoke of this kind of idea whenever he mentioned writing a story, that he would have an image and he would begin writing, and it was like pulling a thread. More came as he pulled. And quite often, I think, not often, I think best when I'm writing my thoughts, and more thought comes as I pull the thread, as the ink flows. Now, after diagramming, which, again, the, the future episodes are going to be replete with diagrammed Bible portions, after diagramming, it's back to reading and reading. I've diagrammed it in order to read it better. And after I've read it more, and I think I have a feel for the text, I've, I've got a, a, a rough outline. I've, I, I understand the structure. I understand how the sentences and the clauses relate to one another. And after, after I've got that in place, the next step is I begin reading the text with others. Commentaries. Spurgeon is reputed to have said, He who will not use the thoughts of other men's brains proves that he has no brains of his own. I find reading with others helpful because while they are certain to make mistakes, there are very frequently going to be different mistakes than I've made, and that proves illuminating, but even better than that. Where they are frequently right they will sometimes be right in areas where I have been wrong. Now, there are other things that I do, but these few things, reading prayerfully, reading to diagram and as a diagram, reading with pen and paper, and reading with others, those four things. Let me say them again. Reading prayerfully, reading to and as a diagram, reading with pen and paper, and reading with others. Those are the best things I do, and that's what I'll be walking you through in future sessions. So check back in next week as we begin, and we'll look at Psalm 62 together. Meridian Church, I love you. Grace and peace.